though, I just like to tell you I'm crazy about intermittent fasting, not only for weight loss but for mental benefits that's why i've created an ebook and i want to share that with you so you can check that out in the link in my description so without further ado let's jump into today's episode Welcome, guys, to another episode of the Christian Buddy Show. Glad to be here. And how are you feeling today, Mark? I'm feeling well, thank you, Christian. Nice to thank be here. You. Thanks for accepting the offer to be here as well. It was a bit of a random email that I sent to the Melbourne Buddhist Centre. So I guess, firstly, how did you get involved in Buddhism? Yes, well, that goes back a long way, Christian. Uh, about the age of 14, I just had this longing quest for the meaning of life. What was it all about? Sitting there in the classroom day after day, year after year, seeing people do the same things. It was really that existential question, what's it all about? And that led me onto the path to explore some of the great religions as one could in those days. And uh, the path took me to the mind and my thoughts took me to the mind that the key must lay in the human mind. And it was a friend who suggested that there are these people in the East called Buddhists who meditated and that way they got to know the world. And that appealed to me very strongly. Wow. Okay. What does the word meditation mean for you? Meditation means exploration of the mind. So increasing level of awareness of what makes us up, what makes us think and therefore do things and say things. And how does it connect with the objective world? That's what meditation means for me. Wow. And I guess in Buddhism, I'm I'm a bit uneducated, so I'm happy for you to educate me and the listeners. What what, is there any ultimate goal for Buddhism or any direction that, that one must take? Yes. The the aim in Buddhism is to release the mind from the bonds of ignorance, ill will and selfish craving. This leads to a liberation or enlightenment where no one is no longer conditioned by these forces and acts purely, naturally and spontaneously out of goodwill, wisdom and generosity and compassion. That's beautiful. That's that's amazing. So but I guess it's a it's a hard it's a hard thing to ask because in the Western world we're we're, we're plagued with all these desires and all these things that bombard our attention and it's it's beautiful because buddhism is is almost about what what i understand from it is that it's about uh almost a quieting of the mind um do you have anything to speak into that do you have any opinions or any any ideas you can expand upon uh yes, yes certainly the practice of uh, the Buddha's teachings uh, does involve a quietening of the mind. Uh, Our minds need to settle from this constant activity, thoughts, ideas, emotions, going everywhere and reacting to our sensory environment and so on. It needs to quieten right down so our awareness, our self-awareness and awareness of other and outside of us becomes much more acute, much more distilled, and until the mind quietens down, it can't really get to that distilled, if you like, even pure state of awareness where uh, one's most skillful beneficial energies are fully uh, immediate and apparent. That can't really occur until the mind quietens down. And it is, as you say, bombarded in this sensory overladen world, you know, racked with consumerism and need for increasing individualism. Yeah, right. Wow. Okay. And I'm going to switch to a bit more of an esoteric question. Uh, What is the true purpose of human life? Well, according to the Buddha, the true purpose of human life is to become enlightened, is to uh, move beyond these bonds of ill will, ignorance and selfish craving and find that uh, unconditioned state of mind or awareness where one is completely free to be kind, generous and wise. Okay. 
That's the purpose if... of human life. Okay. What does enlightened mean? Enlightened, uh, well, if we take the example of the Buddha, and clearly there's been men and women since then and generations since who have followed the Buddha's path to enlightenment and uh, uh, achieved that, that awakening, um, it's uh, a completely unobstructed awareness and uh, knowledge of the way things are and on the emotional counterpart to that cognitive insight of the way things are is the spontaneous compassion and unlimited unconditional kindness. These are the manifestations of the Buddha and the enlightened ones over the ages. So they are by nature ethical. They are by nature wise. They by nature live simply uh, without harm to other living beings and have do not have the fear of death because part of the wisdom of enlightenment is understanding that all things that are born must eventually pass. That is a real key in the Buddhist teaching, impermanence. Okay. And is there like a spectrum on, on enlightenment? Like is there like a like a numeric value? Like like zero is not enlightened and like a hundred is enlightened. Like how do you know if you if you're an enlightened person? Uh, that's a good question, the one that uh, preoccupies a lot of minds. It's not easy to ascertain. The Buddha said to know someone's spiritual depth or grasp of reality takes quite some time observing them in all different circumstances, when they're under pressure, when they're under stress, when they're at ease, how they operate and how they behave in all different circumstances. These are the things which start to measure a person and their path to awakening. And coming back to the first part of your question, yes, it is a gradation of wisdom. We could say the same with just the ordinary human being and getting common sense, common wisdom and common knowledge of living a life. You know, we're a child, then we're an adolescent, then we become an adult. We become a bit wiser, more mature, less impulsive. We see that our actions have consequences to some extent. If we just extrapolate that and develop that on and on, that becomes then... Uh, the, the, the path of the Buddha. And clearly a person who is achieving that maturity of wisdom will be naturally more ethical, more generous, more kind, more patient, and have all these marvellous qualities of humanity which are informed by that wisdom of knowing the impermanent nature of all things. Because so often we want to grasp things and make them permanent, but yeah. they can't be. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And is it with Buddhism? Uh, are we? Uh, what's the idea on being? Is there a notion that we that you need to be a vegetarian, or is that? Uh, I guess yeah. How do you view um, vegetarianism? What's your idea on that? Yes. Well, if we take the the most fundamental principle of Buddhist ethics, which are universal, you'll find them in other traditions and religions as well, of course, but. The first one is not to harm living beings. So if we unfold that principle to all parts of our lives, that, of course, is not hurting other people and uh, therefore not hurting other animals, other creatures of the earth who are sharing the earth and the environment with us. Why would we want to harm them? And, of course, mm. eating meat and products of animals involves harm to these animals. So if we can live without harming them, then it's natural that a person would want to do that given the circumstances they may be living in. Not everyone's in a position to be able to make that choice, but many of us are. And uh, certainly through the Buddhist tradition, there's a very strong thread of vegetarian or vegan principle there because of this principle of non-harm and being kind to all living things. What's your opinion on meat eaters? And um, yeah, what's your opinion on meat eaters? <laughs> Well, I, do, I see people make choices on a basis of the conditions, the way they're brought up, what they're exposed to and what they're aware of. And most people who may, say, come along to our Buddhist centre and learn meditation, and one of them is the cultivation of unconditional loving kindness for oneself, friends, all human beings, and eventually all living things. And they find that with a reflection on life and uh, one's personal needs and circumstances, and doing this practice, they might think, well, what's the point of 
mm. consuming animal products if it causes all that harm when I don't have to. Often people come to that position themselves. So I think it's a, um, a, the point that comes out of your question here, I think, is that it's not an obligation that if you call yourself a Buddhist or come to a Buddhist center, you have to be a vegetarian. It doesn't work like that. We act out of our heart and of our knowledge. And when we come yeah. to that point, we may make a decision to start stepping back on the whole animal consumption thing. Okay. Does the does the word nirvana have any meaning? Yes, nirvana is a word from the ancient Indian language called Sanskrit, which means to blow out or to exhaust. It's another word for enlightenment or Buddha mind or Buddhahood. And it means that we've blown out those root uh, um, poisons, if you like, of greed, ignorance and uh, ill will. They have been exhausted. They've gone from the mind of a person who's enlightened. That is nirvana. There are many ways of indicating it with different terms. But it's such a profound and discreet uh, state of mind or being, if you like. We can barely call it existence. <laughs> We're getting beyond words, and that's where um, philosophy is limited because it, it's, it's, f philosophy has to be expressed in language. Language has limitations because it's got grammatic laws and often with any terms or names, we make things of them and make them permanent. You know, whether it's the chair I'm sitting on or that lamp by my side, uh, we give them a name, then we think they're some sort of permanent object, but of course they're not. They're something which is in a transition and it's a form at the moment that produces particular sensory impressions, but in a hundred years, that just won't exist. Uh, so nirvana is, is, is even beyond this sort of conditional nature of appearance. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And I was kind of inquiring into Buddhism and I was doing a bit of study in, in Buddha himself and it was interesting because he, he brought up this thing called the Eightfold Path. And yeah, I found it quite interesting that he's kind of broken it down into, so it's like right mindfulness, right action, right intention, right livelihood, right effort, right concentration, right speech. So uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I just found it interesting. I, I, um, do you have anything to speak into that, into the, into the Eightfold Path? Yes, it is a key teaching of the Buddha which indicates this is the means by which we can achieve this enlightenment or nirvana as the Buddha did two and a half thousand years ago. And this eightfold path uh, can be even simplified further to a path of ethics, meditation and wisdom. And the ethics there is uh, the right speech, the right action, the right livelihood, and the meditation is the right mindfulness, the right effort, and the right concentration. And the wisdom there is the right view, uh, sometimes called perfect view or perfect uh, uh, wisdom, and uh, also perfect motivation, or sometimes translated as emotion. So there's those three parts of that Eightfold Path to make it even simpler. Ethics, meditation, and wisdom. So ethics we can cultivate in our daily life by just being aware of the things that we say and do have effects on others as well as ourselves. So if we speak abruptly or harshly to somebody, that's probably going to hurt them in some way or make them a bit wary of you. It's going to close down communication and receptivity. Whereas if we speak politely, kindly and courteously, people will be more likely to be receptive, willing to listen to us, willing to help us, and we cooperate and we live more easily together. And mm. likewise, the way we act, whether we you know, walk brusque, briskly through a crowd, elbowing our way through because we want to get somewhere, that's not going to bring about harmony and cooperation and uh, peace of mind to people around us. And of course, not to ourselves because we're upsetting our people, upsetting people on the way through. Let's say if we're sort of getting through a busy train station or something. So it's that awareness of our actions, awareness of our thoughts, and speech, which helps us to conduct ourselves 
in a more kindly and aware way, that brings people to harmony and brings happiness to the world. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Because there's this idea that, yeah, being kind and friendly, I'm not sure how practical it is in the Western world. I understand the notion behind it, but just for my example, working in an office or working in in a busy environment, being kind and nice, I feel like people take advantage of you. And what does the Buddha say in that regard? If if, if people are taking advantage of you mm. for their own personal gains, mm. what what yep. yeah? What's what what? what? Yep, that's a good question. And sometimes you know Buddhism got a bit of a reputation of being nice, and you have to be nice all the time. Well, we're not trying to be nice. We are trying to act out of kindness and awareness. But that awareness also involves the limitations of people at any one time. A very good example is from the Buddha's time. He had a lay supporter, a fellow called Anatha Pindaka. That long word uh, means someone who gives to the poor. Anatha Pindaka is a very generous man. He was a wealthy merchant Christian and he was known for his generosity. He came to the Buddha one day and said, um, uh, Buddha, I, 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 I have this problem with a, a nephew. He, he keeps getting into debt and I end up bailing him out by giving him money. Then he goes and spends it again or wastes it or gambles it. And I've done this three times now and this money is going away. It's not coming back and we're in the same position again and again. Yet I want to be kind and help this person. And the Buddha said, Clearly, this young man is not able to handle money, has not learned the discipline of handling money. Giving him more will not help him. So the best thing to do would be to restrain from that and he needs to, uh, to find his way with money and responsibility. So that's where the wisdom and awareness comes in. Mm. And if uh, people are not uh, responsive or receptive to our attention or what we're giving them, then we either have to think of another way of doing it or just pulling back and saying this person's not ready to receive that or this particular approach, I'll find another way or another time. And the same thing too, if the you know, we you know, if there's someone who is doing harm in the community, it might be a criminal of some sort, um, uh, we're not going to help them by just giving way to all of their crimes. They actually need to be restrained. That's why we have a whole system of law and order. It's based basically on the same ethical principles and that if they're doing harm to others, they must need to be restrained in some way so they stop doing harm and then hopefully they can mend their ways or find some way of rehabilitation or restoration of their uh, good sense. So we don't just tolerate that sort of behaviour uh, when it gets, you know, personal or criminal or something like that we need to call it out and we invoke the laws of the land to uh, to have restraint so they don't do further harm but that doesn't mean we hate them that's the real key mm, yeah that's the real key yeah and that's the real job when someone's threatening you or doing harm our natural reaction is fear and hate in in, in the path of the buddha's teaching we are trying to cultivate an open mind of goodwill but it's still infused with wisdom and we don't have to sacrifice ourselves before bad people. Um, we need to be aware of that, but we don't want to step back into hatred because hatred mm. never overcomes hatred. Only kindness will overcome hatred eventually. Yeah. Yeah, I see it on the... Uh, like even driving. I think driving is the most stressful activity <laughs> you can do. And so many times I've seen my friends, my family just start swearing and just so aggressive when someone, yes, uh, you know, cuts them off or something like this. Yes, yes. Yeah. it's a very common one, Christian. We often hear this in the classes. It's a real trigger for people's uh, anger or reactivity or whatever it is and it being on the road. And, of course, we've got that term, haven't we, road rage? Everyone knows what road rage is. And this yeah. where the whole thing just escalates, all this reactivity of you cut me off or you did this or you didn't do that and now look what's happened and we just that justifies all this ill will and emotion and hatred that goes on. And uh, I know that a lot of our people who come along 
they find that that's a really good barometer for their practice of kindness and patience and mindfulness is driving. And someone cuts them off, said, okay, they're in a hurry or they're not mindful. I don't have to waste my energy on that as long as we're all okay. We'll just break and then proceed on as normal. And uh, I, I know that people have really found that helpful to know. They have actually got a way of overcoming this typical unconscious reactivity to threat of someone takes your space in the car and so on. And uh, the same thing too with your pedestrian or cyclist and someone doesn't give away and they come through a roundabout and they threaten your life, in fact. Then again, we can have the shock and we can have, of course, the get out of the way, put the brakes on or whatever, but uh, we don't have to hate the person. Yeah. And that is a choice. You know, if we slow ourselves down a bit, look at our minds, become aware of our reactions, and we have a way of broadening our view of the person, broadening our view of the person. You know, these people might be in a car, they're hurrying for some reason, they're probably stressed, you don't know what's going on at home, what's happening at work, what's in their mind, or are they just too distracted in the car and they're not looking around, they might be having a conversation with these things in while they're driving and they might have a radio in the background or a screaming child in, in the back and we just don't know where their mind is and there's no point hating them uh, but we're just going to make sure we look after ourselves and don't get injured. Yeah, it's a high stressful situation. I think that's what uh, what adds to the additional angst. And it yeah, it's 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 not a nice situation, but um, it's no. part of life, I guess. Yeah. So. Well, it is part of life. I mean, life will always have threat and eventual suffering. That's inevitable with the human mm. life, and like it is with an animal life, we eventually will be threatened, and eventually we're going to die. And with those two things in mind, we could think through the ways. What's the most agreeable way of behaving and preparing ourselves for these things that will happen which are going to be inevitable what's the best way of handling them and i think the buddha's example the buddha's path mm. gives a very good means for for handling these things in life what's your idea on death death uh inevitable <laughs> comes inevitable. with life comes with life and taxes <laughs> That's right. It's uh, it's inevitable, and uh, anything that uh, that grows will eventually die. And it could be in a short life of an insect uh, over a couple of days, or it could be in the long life over many years of a human. And of course, there's animals around that have much longer lives than humans. So there's all these spans going on, and uh, it's a real key uh, in the Buddhist teaching. Uh, this principle of impermanence that I mentioned earlier because that one is something we often don't want to consider or we are fearful of considering it because any any th thought about change is also leading up to that realization where there will be death which is the final change if you like you know we have change in our life with aging maturity schooling and other conditions but as we go on through life we'll find that people will pass away with their friends or family and eventually of course parents or siblings and it all gets closer and closer and closer with time often we read about death in newspaper on the internet see it on the news here on the radio and it's a little bit abstract but when it comes mm -hmm. closer to home it becomes more real and uh, by knowing by accepting this uh, sooner in life life will become much more agreeable and enjoyable and more accessible in a way in a healthy sort of way if we accept that everything that lives must die. It's a real key feature of our of our reflections. Are you fearful of death? I don't think I'm all that fearful of death itself. Perhaps there is well, there is fear of a terrible means of dying. Uh, you know, having through my 66 years and 40 plus years of uh, medical livelihood, um, I've been witness to many ways of dying. And, of course, we read about things as well, whether they're wars or conflict or torture. And there's a lot of terrible ways to draw. I think that will probably be my key fear rather than the actual ending of this life. What's on the other side? Very good question. <laughs> You've probably read, Christian, that the Buddhist tradition teaches rebirth. That is, until we become enlightened like the Buddha, 
we will keep cycling into another life in another form. Certain uh, habits of consciousness or thinking, if you like, streams of reactivity or psychic energy, if you like, will take form after our death into another form. It may be in human form of one sort or another, or it may even be of another form or even less formful. Um, Buddhism teaches not just the human, the animal realm of existence of manifestation, but also much more subtle forms that we call the realms of the gods. And they can become increasingly subtle uh, and, um, and subtle of manifestation, if you like much more subtle than human and animals but they are still within this rebirth cycle and okay. until we become enlightened we become free of all ignorance greed and ill will uh, we will stay okay. somewhere in the cycle for however long it takes okay so once we become buddha then what happens well that's all you need to do <laughs> Okay. Nothing much more can be said of this state because it's it's unconditioned. It's, so it's really almost it's, it is beyond the realm of words and descriptions. We just use words, symbols, even art, poetry to indicate indicate this profound state of being, if you like. And that's what uh, I think most traditions and religions do: is looking up to something beyond, yeah, much further beyond. The, the animal and the worldly life. And uh, in the Buddhist tradition, we try not to get too descriptive of it or yeah. even prescriptive because it's you can't even describe it as a thing. Because mm. if we think how subtle, you know, we look at elements, we're made up of some sort of earth matter, you know, the food we eat, we're made up of 75% water, so we, we have the water in us. And we, we're generating heat through our chemistry in our body that we receive eventually from the sun through the plants that we eat. And we have this very subtle element of air that you and I are breathing right now and we're sharing with the rest of the living world. And then there's this element of space that we all occupy some sort of space and we, we move around each other's space and other spaces of the world. And then we have this subtle element of consciousness, even more subtle again. So trying to get at this with words designs, formulae and symbol is not so easy. And uh, But if people become aware that their mind, their awareness can grow, that's really all the encouragement we need to head in the direction of the Buddha. Okay. Okay, and yeah, that idea of words are only limited, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a powerful, powerful idea to internalize uh, and speaking of speaking of awareness i, I kind of want to use a few more words to try and um understand so um like with with awareness uh, it, yeah you spoke about uh, spectrums and of awareness and what is awareness well, awareness that's a good question um awareness is where someone or even even a creature, even an animal, has a sense of themselves as a part from something else at this most basic. Mm. So right now I am aware that I am something separate from you, something separate from the people in my house and next door and the other people in the world that is what is at its most basic what awareness is. But trying to quantify that, measure it, is extremely difficult. But we both agree that we have it. And we could probably agree, I won't assume it, that you and I are more aware than the average earthworm out in my garden right here. They move along through various chemical receptors and heat receptors to find food and then their bodies just naturally replicate and that's the worm's life cycle. Whereas you and I, yes, we still have chemical processes and sensory organs and we still process a lot of things, but at a much more sophisticated level that we can leave the earth and the things around us 
we can go on trips to the moon we can meditate we can create a musical instrument and change people's minds with music we can write books and poetry which change people's minds and open the hearts and souls and give them the experiences of beauty we can make decisions which change the lives of others whether that's by doing a project in uh, a poor country by bringing clean water to villages and helping people live more healthily, changing lives, or we can make more weapons and kill people and change their lives that way. That's the capacity of human beings that an earthworm does not have. Okay. I'm going to read out a quote that I found off the internet. I found it off a Buddhist website. So it goes along the lines of, of all innumerable conceptual thoughts that arise from the ocean of our root mind, the most harmful is self-cherishing and the most beneficial is the mind of cherishing others. Uh, what does that mean for you? That is emphasizing the other regarding or the other concerning aspect of, of life, which is most important to the Buddhist that we are not preoccupied with our own selfish concerns. And so much of what we're encouraged to do, as you said earlier in the, in the uh, opening of our interview, was that so much of our consumerist life is about me, what I can get and more of this and more of that. It's about feathering one's own nest and being, instead of being concerned with others. And what we're trying to do in the Buddhist tradition as no doubt other, other traditions and religions, we're trying to relax this overemphasis and this intensity on self-concern, open up to the needs of others around us. Not that we ignore ourselves or denigrate ourselves or that, but we don't overemphasize oneself and one's wants and needs over and above others while there are people who are needy, uh, who are in poor circumstances, and could do with, a, with, with help. So this is the, the real key, is that we start to trans, um, transcend, if you like, or rise above our own selfish concerns and take in the needs of others. That is the path. Okay. When you speak of, uh, I guess, selfish desires and more so the ego, do you think that to a certain degree we need to have an ego uh, or we need to be, yeah. What, what's what's your what's your opinion of that? Do you think the, the ego is necessary? Oh yes, I mean, provisionally, we sort of we really come in come into life with it, don't we? <laughs> you know, very often parents would tell you their, their 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 children, their infants. You know, almost by the day, a personality is emerging. It just comes out so quickly, and you know the the uh, natural self preservation instincts that are built into us all as human beings, as as it is in animals is that we have to find things to eat, food to chop, you know, babies always grasping, putting in the mouth, finding things to eat, just like baby animals do and so on. And uh, they find out what is friendly and warm and safe and what is harmful and painful, and they avoid them. So we've got all these basic survival instincts going on. Those things help contribute to a sense of self and separating out ourselves from others and other things in the environment. And then we have the much more refined and complex dynamics of personality and uh, preferences and uh, emotional patterns and things that we've learned either in previous lives or even in, in this life, which uh, reinforce senses of self-preservation or even self-aggrandizement, you know, wanting to pump yourself up and be ahead of the pack, be on top of the heap. There's all that side of things. Human pride is, is, is in a way natural to us as, as a species, uh, but once that starts to become overinflated, it becomes conceit, and that's where this tendency to selfishness becomes uh, dominant in a person's life. And that's where it's really counterproductive and going the opposite direction to the Buddhist path. Yeah, I, I've definitely felt that way in life and yeah it's it's refreshing seeing or just studying about buddha just, just having to study before interviewing you I, I learned a little bit so it's just refreshing uh 
um, seeing that. So um, I guess maybe moving on to a personal note, I'd kind of like to maybe get to know you more as a person. Sure. And so what was your, so you were a doctor before, well, you've been a doctor for quite some time. That's um, right. Just recently retired, Christian. <laughs> okay. Okay. So have you been a Buddhist your whole life or? Looking back on it, uh, as I mentioned, as a 14-year-old, my search began, I think by my late teens, early 20s, I could say that the Buddhist path was for me was the most attractive. What I didn't have in Australia at that time when I was growing up was really any Buddhist teachers or practitioners. If they were around, I, uh, I, I didn't find them. And I really didn't find uh, people who could present the Buddhist teaching so clearly, particularly my native language, English, until I went to London to complete my specialist training in neurology in the mid-80s. And there I found this particular Buddhist order that I'm involved with. It's now called the Tri Ratna Buddhist Order. It used to be called the Western Buddhist Order. And uh, there I found exactly the people I needed to meet <clears throat> who could present the Buddhist teaching to me in a way that I could pick them up and, and knit them into my own life, particularly as by then I'd taken on the livelihood of medicine with all the training in specialist medicine and so on that it involved. Uh, I knew that I still had to address that great need in me to find the meaning of life and to live more towards the life of the Buddha. But I, I, I did know myself enough, Christian, that I couldn't just go over to Thailand and become a monk or go to Japan and find a Zen monastery. The cultural shift, the language shift would have been far too strong for me. And also I was a young man with all the young man's energies, wanted to see the world and and do all these other things. And I wasn't ready for a monastic life, which is very demanding and very disciplined. I needed a more gradual approach to transformation in my life. Uh, but fortunately, the livelihood of medicine was conducive for me to bring out those more selfless qualities and bring out the mindfulness, bring out the loving kindness and compassion, and also the wisdom to know that all things arise dependent upon conditions and they change dependent upon the change of conditions. That deep, profound wisdom was, has been very, very useful in the medical life as much as the general life. So after a while, uh, I found that my medical life became what you saw in that Noble, noble Eightfold Path as right livelihood. It was a livelihood that, su that supported the progress towards wisdom and kindness uh, rather than being counter. Like, say, if I worked in an alcohol industry or a weapons industry or a gambling industry, that would be much harder to reconcile that sort of livelihood with the Buddhist principles. So I was lucky that medicine did provide a wonderful platform for me to become more familiar with the Dharma, the Buddhist teachings um, and its practices and incorporate them. It's still made for a busy life, I'll say that right now. I mean, medicine itself is, is a demanding livelihood for all the learning, study and one has to do and, and stay up with it. Um, but it's been a very, very rewarding one uh, after 40 years. And um, I'm not sure I could do it any differently. I made the decisions I did in my time, my age and my conditions, and I have no regrets. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. Would you say that Buddhism in a way complements your, your career? As That's a, a very good way of putting it, Christian. It's been... Uh, Complementary and perhaps even more, it's also deeply informed the practice of medicine. So it's become more of a vocation. Vocation is like a calling to a particular task. You might, vocation teaching might be a, a vocation. Yeah, Nursing would be a vocation. Medicine can be a vocation. But of course, some people approach those different professions from different angles or from different backgrounds and different reasons. But if it's a calling, you feel that's where I must spend my life. It became more of a calling because I saw the opportunity uh, to practice patience and kindness and try to bring some light and wisdom into people's distress 
when whatever they presented with, whatever the symptoms or disease or or so on. And it was a remarkable opportunity of one human being to be asked to help another. That is a very precious opportunity that doesn't come to everybody. And I recognize as the decades went by what a privilege it was to be in that position. So I'll, um, uh, simply with time, I became more appreciative, felt and expressed my gratitude for the position that I had in my society of being uh, a doctor. And I'm curious about your, your Buddhist name. So Silla Dasa, so how does that work? How do you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, firstly, it's meaning. Um, Sila means ethics in the ancient uh, Indian language, Sanskrit and Pali. Sila, S-I-L-A, is ethics. And Dasa, D-A-S-A, -A, means one who serves. So the man who ordained me into this Buddhist order in 1992, he gave me this name because he recognized there were certain qualities of ethical observation and interest I had that would serve my path in towards wisdom of the Buddha. If I served ethics by practicing ethically, cultivating my ethics, this would also support a mind which is better skilled at meditation, more aware, more compassionate and more able. So ethics is a real foundation. So he said, if you serve ethics in your life, this will serve your path to wisdom and enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. So he gave me that name. So when someone uh, uses that name, it reminds me of my purpose and reminds me of that ordination in that night in June 1992. Wow. Do you feel enlightened? I'm not enlightened. I'm not a Buddha. Uh, okay. But... I feel confident that I'm on the path okay. and that might be a long, long way away, but that doesn't worry me so much anymore because I know that each step is really up to me. It's in my hands. No one's beating me with a stick or pushing me or pulling me to do this or that. It's in my hands uh, what I do and when I do it. But the more I give myself to this path, the better life becomes. In terms of me feeling at ease with life in its ups and downs, its ins and outs, all the vicissitudes of life, and, you know, I've seen through the death of my parents some um, 10 or 12 years ago, death of friends, illnesses, and so on, and my time will come. But with practicing the Buddha's teaching, taking on this path of ethics, ethics meditation, and wisdom, in the context, I'll say, Christian, of a great body of friends in this spiritual life, uh, that is a very key feature of the Buddhist life. And in particular, our order is this having friends in the spiritual life, friends that will be both be mentors and also be mates. And yeah. knowing that that's a dynamic, they'll always be mates, but sometimes they're mentors. And uh, like the fellow who ordained me, Sabuti, in 1992, he's still alive, of course. He's in his 70s now. He lives in England. Um, he's... He's, he's a mentor to me, always has been, and I think always will be. And I have such friends here in Australia as well. So this is a real key feature because this path is long. It is not easy. It's simple enough in one, in one way, but it's not easy. Yeah. And to have friends to support you and love you and be an example for you is absolutely essential. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And... Uh, what does the Buddha say on life purpose and, I guess, goals in a sense? Mm, yeah. He used the word, he did use the word uh, nirvana and, and enlightenment, but one of the most frequent words he used was liberation, freedom okay. from the suffering of the human condition due to this ignorance not knowing the way things are, not knowing that actions have consequences due to selfish greed and due to the eruption of ill will and anger in all its forms, these things cause suffering. Liberation is the end of those forms of suffering. It doesn't mean to say your body's not going to suffer and die. That happened to the Buddha. But that didn't produce an overall great distress for him. He said it can't be any other way. 
but he had no fear of the death. Yeah. No so liberation, liberation from the root poisons of greed, ignorance and ill will. That is the freedom that we, we humans can aspire to. Yeah. And what does your day-to-day -day life look like at the moment? Mm. Uh, yeah, mm. being a Buddhist. Yeah. That's a good question. That will probably vary for every Buddhist, depending on what they do. Um, and as we know, traditionally, people often see Buddhists as those who live in monasteries in robes, have a monastic sort of life, and those who don't and support or go to a temple on a weekend. Our order is something across those two extremes, if you like. But um, let's just take me back a few years when I was still working in medicine. I'd be going into the Austin Hospital in northeast uh, Melbourne here. And I'd be doing clinics there and teaching rounds and going to clinical meetings, um, doing a little bit of peripheral uh, help towards research and so on. And all the communication that's involved was also some private practice locally. And I used to, monthly I'd drive up to Bendigo in central Victoria for two days a month to be a visiting specialist there and sometimes visit the hospital as well as run a, a private clinic. And so I would be a doctor and uh, I would obviously befriend people and get to know people over time wherever I worked and I try to make as much as I could of the opportunities to each contact we make with someone we met for the first time or someone we know very well each meeting will be different because it's fresh we're different people each time we meet because we've had our own unique past in the last week or day or month or year yeah. and we are different people and uh, we meet afresh so I try to go with that open-mindedness, open-heartedness and listen to people, understand them and uh, then begin the communication with whatever we needed to do. But always be the first to smile and the first to speak was one of the marks of the Buddha and I found that was very helpful, particularly being a, quite a shy boy in my early life. Medicine really needed me to open up and to be able to meet people. Um, and I guess what might be a little bit different from my day is that, yes, I would be, I'd, you know, maintain a, a plant-based or vegan ethic, eating ethic for decades now. Uh, so that would be a little bit different, but that's much more commonplace in Australia now. It used to be rare mm -hmm. going back 30 or 40 years, but it's much more common now. And uh, likewise, I mean, it wouldn't be obvious, but, you know, the clothing I choose, I try to make sure it's not so harmful to the environment, let alone to animals. So again, my shopping would be guided by my ethical uh, intent and also the amount of consumption I try to do as well. I try to be conservative in the way I use resources because uh, we are using them up at an alarming rate in our developed industrialized societies. We are chewing through our resources at a massive rate and polluting. And I feel partly responsible for that because I'm here, I'm eating, breathing, living and consuming like the other six billion of us uh, but you know to a large extent uh, the industrial world is causing a lot of it so i'm aware of that as well so that might inform the way i make choices and try to use bicycle public transport or walk on foot um, uh, if i don't really need to take the car and uh, so there's little decisions like that so my awareness of other and the impact of my life on others and the world does flow into those lifestyle choices Yep. So I think that will be a difference as well. Um, and let's say, let's take another example. Uh, alcohol, I was discussing this recently with uh, with some friends here where I live. And I, I enjoy a glass of wine occasionally or a glass of beer, but I'm not keen on getting intoxicated. I don't like the feeling of the way it mm -hmm. hits the brain. I don't like that at all. And I'm really very easy for me to go without alcohol. And of course, when I'm away from home or on retreat, of course, there is no alcohol. I don't miss it at all. And I think there will be a point very soon where I'll just say, well, I don't think I'll take it. Even just to say, we can show that people you can be happy and healthy without having to drink or you can socialise without having to drink And because this is a big issue in Australia as it is in many countries. Yeah. Alcohol is a major issue. And yeah. if, I'm, if I'm buying the stuff, that's sort of contributing to the production and keeping the prices low and uh, makes it very, very available. So uh, I don't think maybe next time we, we have a chat, I'll probably be teetotal. Okay.
Coffee? I don't mind coffee. I like it as a drink, uh, just once in the morning with breakfast or after breakfast. Uh, I don't need need much of it. I don't really get a big buzz from it like people talk about. I just like the smell and the taste. Probably the smell is even better than the taste. Yeah. Uh, tea is another thing. And again, it's not from a sort of a, a drug or intoxication angle. The tea is just a refreshing beverage. And yeah, from my exposure to the Buddhist tradition, uh, I've come across the Far Eastern traditions of tea. You've heard of the Japanese tea ceremony, or of course, tea started in China millennia ago, and they've done everything you can do to a tea leaf that you can possibly imagine in three or 4,000 years. And yeah. they've got the most exquisite tea culture, which informs and is part of the very fabric of their whole history in China. So if you don't know tea, you can't know China. And of course, that had a massive influence across Asia, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, and so on, tea. And then, of course, the rest of the world after the, um, you know, the tea wars in China that precipitated the growing of tea in India and eventually Sri Lanka and other parts of the world. So uh, this brings tea ceremony or even just tea making, tea presentation, brings to a, a whole lot of the threads we've talked about all come together in tea, um, whether it's the fact that I choose the best water, the best bowl and the best tea to make a bowl of tea or a pot of tea for my guests, such as Christian sitting across the table from me. Yeah. I'll do it carefully and mindfully, and hopefully my movements will be fluent and unobtrusive and will flow like water, and you will enjoy this bottle of tea with a beautiful aroma, a gorgeous colour and a delightful taste, and we can bowl after bowl after bowl of it, and we won't be intoxicated at all, <laughs> and we will be calm and peaceful and very happy. Yeah, well, that sounds... Like a good experience. <laughs> Consider it uh, an open invitation, Christian. Yeah, okay, I will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, I uh, I might end the, the podcast there, Siladasa. It was um, it was refreshing and, and in, enlightening to speak with you. So um, how, can, how can people, if people are curious, more curious or people want to learn more, what's the best way to do so? I think uh, meeting other Buddhists is probably the most direct way to go about it. Um, I'm not sure where your your um, your studio is, Christian. Are you in Melbourne or outside of? Uh, I'm in Melbourne. Melbourne, yeah. yep. So in Melbourne's got about about a hundred different Buddhist centres and temples and contacts. So there's a lot of them, and I think if you're interested in the meditation side, just choose a, a place that offers meditation classes in English. There's plenty of them around. That would be a good way in. If you want to learn more about the actual tradition and the principles, the Eightfold Path, enlightenment, things like that, there's courses around in various uh, centres as well. The one that we run in Brunswick is called the Melbourne Buddhist Centre and the website is melbournebuddhistcentre.org.au and that's got all range of classes, courses, drop-ins, anything you want. It's there for an invitation for people to uh, to touch this path and see where it leads them fantastic all right guys well thanks for listening and thanks for your time there